Great. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Trevor Owens. Um, I work uh, at the Library of Congress. I work for the NDIP program, which if you're familiar, is uh, our website is digitalpreservation.gov, so I'll just pull that up quick. Um, so again, digitalpreservation.gov. And if you want to, um, you know, keep tune in for updates about our our projects, um, ViewShare included. I'd highly recommend following us on Twitter. We're just N D double I double P on Twitter, and we are uh, also have a blog um, called The Signal, and we actually have a lot of posts on there about the software, sort of user stories, what people are doing with it. Um, so I'd suggest that folks, and well, I'll pull up a couple of those as we get into uh, looking at the software too, because they're really nice resources for seeing what people are actually doing with the software. So, um, and those blog posts are, our blog is at um, blogs.loc.gov slash digital preservation, and you can search their review share, you'll find a lot of different um, information about the software. But so I'm jumping back to the home page here. Um, and again, the, the tool is called ViewShare. The, the gist of it is, is that it's a, a free platform for creating uh, dynamic interfaces to digital collections. Um, and so we'll make that concrete very quickly here. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of what it can do. But the gist of this is that um, if I scroll down, you'll see sort of the three main things that we're going to do. We, we have the ability to import collections, um, so we can upload data from something as simple as a spreadsheet or from a set of mods records or a few different other structured data formats. Then we have the ability to build um, these interactive views of them and then ultimately to embed and share those views. The, the sort of key concept with this is that it shouldn't, the goal here is that it shouldn't take you any sort of um, particular technical or coding skills to be able to create um, these interactive interfaces. It's basically the, the you know, the, if you can manipulate spreadsheets and, uh, you know, work through a web application like, like, you know, using Gmail or any number of things like Flickr, you should be good to go to work with this. And so I'll show you a couple examples of the software first, and then we'll pause for questions and I can work through um, sort of the steps to actually use the tool. And we should have plenty of time to do that and then have plenty of time for questions still. But before I do that, I should mention that everyone can request an account. Um, if you click the request an account button here, um, there's a very simple page where you sort of fill in the username you want, password you want, um, the name of your organization and what your organization, what sort of category it falls in. The, the gist of that is that we want we're, we're in a position to provide this to people working with cultural heritage organizations broadly defined. Um, so you guys all probably fall into that category. And someone will, within a day or two, sort of approve your account and then you're good to go to do everything I'm doing on the site. Um, so to begin with, I'll show you a view. Off of our home page here, um, well, and I should also mention that we, we have some rather nice documentation. So if you once you've gone through this whole thing and you have you feel like um, maybe you get lost or you don't remember exactly how to do a step, if you click on any of these boxes at the bottom, like import collections, there's actually some really nice, very step-by-step -step directions for how to work through each of these phases in this. So the, that's sort of the importing page and, and there's the same thing for each of the others. So here's the documentation for generating views, etc. So to start, I'll show you what one of these views looks like. Um, so this view was created uh, by a colleague of mine, and it is a view of 340 different trade cards from Fulton Street in Brooklyn. Um, and you can see he's got a little description of the view up in the corner. Then he has these facets on the side here, the business types and um, the subjects that he was able to extract out of the out of the data he uploaded, and then our primary interface is this map. And if we click on one of the pins, we'll see the item level information. In this case, a, a particular card, and we also have a link back to where this comes from on Broken Public Library's website. So this whole view started its life just basically as a spreadsheet that. Uh, 
my, my colleague had on his desktop with data in these fields and he was able to upload it. So this is the map view and you'll notice that the these are all color coded based on categories so you're able to set that inside the tool um, but if we want to we could just see the ones that have carpets on them and then zoom in and pull up uh, one of those individual trade cards. So it's sort of an exploratory tool with faceted browsing um, based on very simple uh, data set that we loaded. I can switch to other views. I've got a list view so I can go to the list here and again let's just see the um, cards that came from advertising agencies and now we have sort of a much more extensive full report of their data. We can view them in an image gallery. Um, maybe I want to add in the book binders. So now we've got the advertisers and the book binders. And the last one is kind of neat. There's a pie chart. So if I wanted to see um, what the subjects for those look like, this is what the subjects look like, or the formats. Um, and I can add in more of these and see how those change. So um, for example, here's what the subjects look like when we're looking at these seven different types of businesses. And I can click on the pie chart to see what any specific chunk of the chart is. But so consistently with all the views, as you click around in any part of it, you're sort of um, you're visualizing how parts of the whole relate to each other. Um, so it's neat both as an access interface to the collection and just for, for sort of a curator working with it to understand some of the ways that the data plays out in different um, sort of interfaces. So that's the, the trade card view. Um, I'll show a couple more before I work through the uh, example. Uh, so one of the, I'll show two more views I think and then um, we can go on from, we'll go into the example. Or actually we'll have question time before we go into working through an example. So um, as I mentioned we've got some great blog posts up about using the tool. This is with um, uh, Jennifer who's an archivist in um, in Texas and she worked with with one of these views and actually ended up embedding it in the home page of their content DM site for one of their collections and so on this if you go into the blog and I can send these links to, to Laura to share to with everybody afterwards but it sort of walks through how she used it what she used it for some good pictures of it um, and then here's one version of the view the, the a neat feature with this is that it can actually do um, one of the displays is uh, scatter plots. So in this case, if you have two kinds of numerical information, you can actually have that plotted out and we can um, look through here and find an individual item from a particular year. Um, in this case, this data set is interesting in that it's actually transcribed information off of funeral records that they have in a collection. Um, so when we go in and actually click on an individual record, it'll load up the actual funeral record for this individual that they have in their digital collections. Um, and so again, they have transcribed this information, put it in a spreadsheet, and now there's um, this very uh, interesting way to explore that data. So there's that individual view of it, and we'll go back, and here is their view share of it. Now in this case when you have numerical information there's some neat charting you can do. We have um, uh, sort of people's ages, the years they died in, the years they were born in, um, and uh, we can go through and see things like, you know, which are there trends based on religion in this data set. Here's the sort of uh, different religious groups trending in this whole corpus of data. Um, there's a race information that was recorded on those funeral records. Um, and so there's some interesting ways to sort of explore the relationships between these items. Um, and then also, they very interestingly have um, geographic information for where people were ultimately buried. And so you can sort of see the epicenter of where the funeral home, all the records came from, was. Um, but then you can zoom out and see, um, you know, some people made it as far away as Boston and California. And then there's also a gallery view of the uh, individual pages as well. So 
that's another example. The last one I'll show is, is a very recent one. This one actually, the, the post for this, you can see went up September 6th. So this just very recently went up. And this is an example where a um, uh, African American studies professor put together a really interesting view to accompany a book she's working on. Um, the book is uh, about sort of um, autobiographies from black authors who traveled internationally. And so she wanted to sort of pull together information about these and ended up building this view, which is a way to explore the, the sort of data that she had collected in the process. So it's um, each of the pins is actually a place that one of the um, African-American memoirists she uh, discusses in the book um, visited. And so, for example, we can look at all the places that Duke Ellington visited over time and wrote about in different places and see, for example, that he visited Egypt in 1964 and then find other information about him here. Um, and again, this is sort of been put together as something to accompany the book that she worked on. Um, but similarly, it's an exploratory view of, of this uh, digital sort of collection here. Um, so with that, I will pause and take any questions. I think I can see when people chat questions. So if you have generic questions about the uh, particulars of what, what I've shown so far. Um, we're going to get into how to actually do this next, but um, just wanted to make sure everyone has a sense of the kinds of things that you can make with the tool. So this is probably a good spot to shift over, and so I will um, start from scratch here. Now if you want to, I'll mention that if you go to Import Collections, you can actually download the spreadsheet I'm going to start from, the Fairfax postcard spreadsheet, right from this link. But um, I've already done that, so I will just load it up. So the way that ViewShare works is that there's two sort of principal components to everything here. There's data sets, and then there are views of those data sets. And those are represented up here in the right corner. I've got the data and the views tab. If I go to the data tab, there's a green button here where I can upload data. That's what I'm going to ultimately do. But I've also got all the other 85 data sets I have here. And um, one of the things that's neat, if you go to viewshare.org slash data slash T-R-O-W, that's my username, you can actually see all of my data sets too. And you could also build your own views off of my data sets. Um, you wouldn't be able to delete them or edit them, but you could um, build and inspect them. So these are my different data sets, but we're going to upload a new one. <coughs> Excuse me. So here are the four different ways that we can upload data. Um, the content DM uploader is, is very problematic. It, it doesn't really work in many cases. The OAI endpoint does work if you have um, an OAI PMH uh, capability for a collection, then you can use that, but uh, most of us most of us don't. Um, and then it can also take XML mods files. Um, it'll actually take almost any kinds of XML files too. Um, so that's an option. And then the last one which we'll use today is to upload a spreadsheet. Um, so I'm going to upload from a file on my computer and we'll choose the file. I'm going to choose this Fairfax postcards file and then I'll say upload. And while it's working, I'll actually show you guys what this individual spreadsheet looks like. And again, as I mentioned, this is up on the website, so you can take it down and look at it as a template if you want an example to work from. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We have uh, columns that have uh, uh, field names at the top. So there's a name field, there's a city and state field, there's a associated date field, there's a description field, and these each have sort of little paragraphs about these postcards that we're going to be working with. And there's a category field which has um, a handful of different categories that I've sort of organized my postcards into. Um, they're concatenated with um, commas, so we'll, we'll want to sort of be able to treat them as um, uh, different data than just plain text, and we'll be able to with the tool when we get there. And then I have a whole bunch of URLs for the images themselves. Um, and you can see the end in .jpg, so these are actually the uh, images themselves that we'll get to. Um, so there's an example of one. 
and then um, a bit of extraneous data that we'll probably get rid of and I've added in a field for the country that they're all from even though they're all from the United States um, and then I actually already had lat longs but um, we'll generate our own too so don't worry too much about that so to begin with I'm uploading my data set and we can see that that's already happened over here so um, you can see that it's basically taken the the field names uh, category the image numbers etc and pulled those out as the the field names from the top of the first row in the spreadsheet and then I can tab through the 22 individual records in there and um, at this stage uh, ViewShare lets me go in and explain what kinds of information these fields are so it doesn't do any guessing for me I'm just gonna tell it that this field with those JPEGs in it is actually images and it's gonna wrap them in little um, image tags um, it's also gonna make our interface look a little cleaner here since it doesn't have that giant long URL with no break in it and then I can go through there's some extraneous information so I'll actually get rid of the other images field and um, we can just pretend I don't I'll get rid of the lat longs just so I can show you how you would generate those if you didn't have them so now we're down to our core data fields here I'm gonna also set 1879 this related date field I'm gonna make it a number um, because that's going to let me use it for the numeric uh, sort of ways of counting. And then I can tab through these again, see all the things that I've got. And this is looking pretty good. So then I will save it. And I wonder if something's up on my monitor here. For some reason my computer here is, is messed up on this individual thing, so I'll actually just load one up from uh, when, when we get through this part. Um, so I'll go back to, I have another copy of that data set up here to begin with. Um, so let's... So here's the same postcards data set. Um, I'm going to go in and edit it. Um, I think someone's microphone is on. Um, right. Let's see. Okay, so we're back to where we were basically. I'm going to edit the data set and um, let's see. Um, okay, so back here we are. I'm going to add. So I've got my, my basic data here. I've got the the images, I've got the numbers for dates, um, and I'm going to add some new fields derived from these fields um, to get us started here. So I will add a field for um, ISO date. And so there's a very, there's a standardized date format. It's necessary for making timelines. Um, so I'm going to derive that from the uh, related date field here and say create and then when I hit the augment button it will um, sort of generate these longer strings that you need to be able to put dates and it's just basically assuming that um, since we didn't have more granularity it's going to put them on the timeline at the first day of the the first year and it's telling us that it was able to generate values for each of those I will add a map field using both the city and state data and the country data. So it's going to put both of those things together and we'll call this lat long. 
And what it's going to do is it's going to ask a, a service called GeoNames if it can identify what the combinations are there. So what the combination of Gunston Hall, Virginia, and United States will get it. Um, if we click Augment, you see that it's got 22 values generated for each of those locations. So now they all have a point of latitude and longitude associated with them. And I'll add, um, I'll break apart those themes. Or just themes. So in this case, I'll take that category field and I want to break it apart based on commas. So it's going to create, um, and if you don't follow why that's useful, it'll become apparent when we're actually building an interface to a collection. So then I'll click Augment. And what you'll see is, if we find an example of one of them that's in... So this, this card, for example, is in Famous Residences and Military History, but it'll treat them as sort of a bulleted list instead. So it knows that it's in two separate categories instead of being in one category that's Famous Residences, Military History. Um, but again, that'll be more evident when we actually build the view. So I will save my data set. I've done a little bit of work sort of adding value to it, getting these extra data fields down here added, um, and sort of organizing it a bit. Now I will um, uh, and go ahead and build an interface. So when I click to build, it's going to ask me for which layout I want. Um, this is the blue squares are where those little facets go, like the um, numbers, etc. And the big yellow area is where the views go. So I'll take um, this one and then uh, at any point from here on out, I can click on Show Preview and see what it would actually look like if I was done with it. Um, but I'll go through and set some of these features. So for starters, we can add views. Um, and we've got, for example, a map, a scatter plot, pie chart, gallery, timeline, list. These were all the things we sort of saw examples of already. I'll add a map. Um, and it's by default figured out that it should use the latitude and longitude data. I'll move the map to be first. We can switch over to the preview, and we're seeing our items pinned on the map. Um, and I'll switch back to the builder. Now I can say something like, oh, we'll use the themes to color, color code the, the map. And then we can switch back to the preview, and now we've got our themes showing up and actually color coding all of our pins. Uh, I'll switch back to the builder. Um, now if you scroll down to the bottom here, you can choose which fields you want to show in each individual view. So I will turn off a bunch of these just because the, the, there's a lot of information to display on the map. So maybe we'll just keep the pictures and include the titles and make sure there's a link. Now if I switch to preview, when I click on one of these, we'll see just the sort of image and the link. Um, and then I can go in and customize what I want to show on the list view. Um, you can drag these to reorder them. Um, turn off a few more of these fields. But maybe I want to keep a lot of them. Put titles in based on names. And then I will show the preview. Click over to the list. And here's our list view. Um, I'll add just a couple more real quick. An image gallery and a timeline, and it's going to fill these in, and there's always just a bunch of little options to configure with each individual view. Um, so you can sort of go and, and play with those and see what you like, but then I'll switch here, and we've now got a timeline that I can scroll through and explore these, a image gallery with images of them all, a list view, and the map. Um, so I'll add a few sort of widgets on the side to give us those different facets. Um, search box, I'll add a numeric slider for the date, so this is actually going to let me sort of see the relative frequency of dates. Um, I can add a list of, say, those themes, and then 
and click on show preview again and now we've basically built a whole view if i click on famous residences i'm only seeing those and that's changing the related dates up here as well um, and then i just need to save it and let me give it a name and choose if i want to make it public or private i'm going to make it um, public and here's my view at this point uh, one of the really neat things here is that I can click on embed and I can just copy this one script here and paste this into an HTML document and then embed the whole view in the same way you would say a YouTube video and so for example um, here's actually me having done that on my own website um, and so you can see that it sort of refit itself to fit inside my website um, and the styles have changed to sort of fit the style of my own site and um, that's really the the sort of run through of the whole tool there so um, it works the same with different sorts of original data sets so if you start with mods records or other kinds of data you work through the exact same process once you've uploaded the data and then just as as there was a question about it um, from any of, I'll show you quickly how to how to replace your data set or, or um, overwrite or add new data. So if you go to the inspect tab, um, from here I've got my data set and I can inspect the data set and then there's this refresh link. And so if I added some new things to that spreadsheet, I could then go and choose the spreadsheet again, uh, re-upload it and then it would all I need to do is hit augment once and then it would actually fill out all of that information for for each of the um, views I built off of that uh, data set so it's um, very straightforward process to um, add to the data um, but you need to do it in your original um, data source and it doesn't do that inside the actual tool itself so that's a quick run through of the tool, how it works, what you can build with it, um, and so at this point it'd be a good idea to turn to questions people have. Um, um, so Four is asking about copyright issues. Um, uh, the the gist of it is is that um, there could be copyright issues with any images potentially. So um, uh, the, there's sort of a click-through license you do that you're sort of, you know, not going to violate copyright to, when you use the tool, but it basically uses the same conventions that anything else on the web does in terms of being able to link to images um, and display them elsewhere. So, um, so that's sort of, you know, on you as a user. So feel free to Throw, throw more questions at me. I'm happy to respond to them. So Betsy's asking, when refreshing a data set with a new upload, do you need to configure, augment the entire set, or just the new fields? Um, it will rerun the augmentation for the whole thing because it doesn't know if you've changed data in old fields. So for example, um, you know, you can actually go and if, if I went into my spreadsheet and said, oh, I was wrong, this was in 1857 and I changed it to um, 1840 or something like that. Um, it's actually going to check, catch that I changed that when it refreshes the data. Um, and to do that, it then will need to re-augment the, the rest of the data. But it doesn't really take any more time for you um, as it just sort of does that pretty seamlessly. So I'll take Bet Betty's question first. Um, people using this very local maps and associated data and images. It works quite well with very um, very close in maps. There's a couple of examples but I'm not going to know the, the URLs for them just off the top of my head. So if you do have... Um, the other thing I'd note is that the, the lookup service for names is not at an address level. So if you did have address level um, things you'd want to use a different tool like um, 
there's a tool called I'll show this quick just because it's of general use um, uh, something called get lat long there are a few different things like this where you can just very easily find a point of latitude for an individual point but say for example I had you know a series of things around uh, where I live in Virginia I could go and actually look up very specific points of latitude and longitude um, and just copy these into my spreadsheet. There are a few things that will do this in bulk too for street level addresses. Um, so if you Google around, you'll find those. But you can see, you know, you can be as precise as you want and get different points that'll all work. Um, jump back to the questions. Um, so okay, Robert. Oh well, I'll, I'll answer Robert's Fulton cards. Um, those were done with. Um, they were done in a batch way with a different lat long service. I think if I do a search for this, it'll actually come up pretty quick too. Um, so there's a a yeah, there's a few of these things out here like this. Um, Uh, just forget about that. Where you can drop in a whole list of addresses and get back a whole list of points of latitude and longitude for them. So that's how the, the Fulton Street collection was created. Um, and there's a few different services you can use to do that in the back end on this one, but there's a whole range of these things where you just paste in a whole column of addresses and it will, you know, spit back a column of points of latitude and longitude that you can then copy and paste back into a spreadsheet. Um, so that's how that one was done and that's how a lot of those can be done um, and then who is expressing the most benefit from sharing their data this way we we've we've got sort of two main use cases that 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 we like with this um, we've had folks at very at, um, one of them is sort of individuals working at smaller organizations or or groups where they don't necessarily have those like a tech team that could build out you know their own application for displaying collections in these kinds of ways um, and so we've seen a lot of use in smaller organizations at cultural um, at things like uh, historical societies um, or situations where individual scholars will create these views to particular collections without necessarily needing to um, you know develop a whole lot of deep technical skills um, the other side we've seen is is a fair amount of take up among um, much larger organizations where individuals want the ability to um, create uh, to very quickly prototype and explore what might be useful ways to work with their um, collections and so they'll um, use this tool to very quickly explore those sorts of things and then potentially present them to the, the more technical folks they work with and the last one I guess I'd mention is there are some who are not necessarily even using them publicly to share their views but just to sort of very quickly get a sense of how the, the shape of a collection and how it's working and just use it to sort of inform their own um, either collecting practice or you know, decide if they're really doing a good job of using descriptive metadata that sort of will help people differentiate between the items and in those cases it serves a really nice sort of internal use case. Um, so those are who I'd point to as different examples and as I mentioned if you go to our blog and do a search for ViewShare there's actually a lot of um, different examples in here um, of different use cases for it so you know, here's 23 different posts that have ViewShare involved in them, um, and many of them are, are you know, for example, we use it ourselves on digitalpreservation.gov for a few different uses, and we describe some of those here as, as ways to explore the content. Pull this up again. Yes, um, so four's question um, exactly if you if you can get your information into a spreadsheet and you have those different kinds of uh, uh, numerical information it'd make for a really nice um, view and as long as you've got um, place names or points of latitude and longitude it's easy to sort of build the maps out of them glad you like it <laughs>
Yes, exactly. The images have to be um, have to have URLs, um, and you can, if you, in many cases, organizations will have their own sort of sets of sort of their content online somewhere. But in the same, at the same time, if you uploaded your photos to Flickr or to Picasa or something like that, and then just got the URLs for them, that would work as well. So they just need to be online somewhere. Um, so if you have your own server space, you know, you could upload the files, or you could use any number of services to get the get those uh, files up on the web, and then you just need the URLs for them. Yeah, I should mention that there's uh, some, uh, when you do start working with the tool, if you have ideas for things you'd like it to do that it doesn't currently do, we're always excited to get more feedback about it. So you can go and see, for example, other features that users are requesting. Um, you can post your own ideas for features you'd like it to have. And then um, if we go back to the base here, there's also a few um, knowledge base articles that we have up in the feedback section. Um, for example, uh, we have this 10 minute ViewShare tutorial and how to use ViewShare and Omeka together. And the 10 minute ViewShare tutorial is basically just walking you through step by step what we did with that spreadsheet of postcards. Um, and the uh, how to use ViewShare and Omeka together is an example of uh, an actual uh, Omeka website that was built out of that same set of information and how you can sort of use the two together if you want to just say use Omeka to host your images and, and create exhibits um, and then ViewShare as a way to navigate and explore that collection and they sort of fit together seamlessly. So there's some great documentation up on the website um, and uh, we're happy to sort of give work with people on feedback that you can give through the, the, the site there as well. Any other questions? And then we'll probably um, probably be ready to wrap up a few minutes early. Um.